I don't know about the rest of you, but I think that's been the best part of my day, of the week. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank y'all for being here very much. All right, well, thank you for, for those of you who've come out tonight to join us for our community dialogue on safety and security here in Fort Bend ISD. You can see up here on the screen, we're going to start with kind of a high-level overview, and, and I want you to tell me, what do you see when you look at that screen? What does it look like? Lines, rhythm, heart rhythm, the heart the beating of our district, our students, the safety and security of our students and our staff. It is so important that we are here this evening, and although we have few people with us, we hope you go out in the community and share information about where your community members and friends and family can find information about this plan at the end of tonight, because we sure want to make sure that we are keeping our students and staff in Fort Bend ISD safe and secure, and we protect that the heartbeat of our district. I want to give you a little bit of background. First of all, my name is Beth Martinez, and I work in Human Resources. I'm the Executive Director for Talent Management and Development, and you can contact me after this presentation. If you have any questions, I can kind of facilitate answers through the Police Department, through Chief Riders Group. Um, I was involved in the district strategic planning process that started back in the summer, and then we engaged with the community beginning in, in September. And just very recently, in April, the board approved the facilities master plan. They adopted the facilities master plan, which will take us forward in planning for the future, the next 10 years here in our district. And so directly after that, Chief uh, started working on drafting the safety and security plan that he's going to explain to you this evening. And we're replicating the same community engagement model that was used during the facilities master planning process because without the engagement and input from the community, we're not heading down the right path. And we want to make sure that as a learning community and as a school district, that we have the voice of the community. We know what it is that you're concerned about. We know what you believe has the highest impact in terms of safety and security of our students and staff. And that's why you're here this evening. So again, thank you for being here. The facilities master planning process started with a needs assessment. And the facilities needs assessment is the starting point for the safety and security planning process as well, because every facility within the district was assessed in terms of needs. And so moving forward, Chief is going to share with you some of our current needs, how that aligns with best practices, and uh, research in the field moving forward. Throughout this process, as we did with our last planning process, we are driven by the core beliefs and commitments that were created by our Board of Trustees. Everything that we do aligns with the core beliefs, and our core commitments to the students and staff of this district. And then again, driven by our mission and vision here in Fort Bend, keeping our eye on what is most important, what drives us every day, and what our mission is to achieve within the district. I mentioned to you the community engagement process. We started with the needs, so we have that data. We're bringing to you that information this evening. The next step is to gather your feedback. You will be participating in an individual survey at the end of this evening's meeting where you give us your impressions or your input around how you believe the certain interrelated uh, components or options the Chief is going to explain to you this evening, what impact that has on the safety and security of students and staff. And then you're going to answer a couple of open-ended questions. There's also a time for you to, to ask some questions here. We're a small, informal group, so that'll be nice to be able to get your input in that way as well. Following tonight's meeting, likely by tomorrow afternoon, we will have the video of tonight's meeting posted on the website. We will email out to the community and to many of you to forward that information out to your friends and family and neighbors, those in your contacts, so that if you, people were not able to come to the last three meetings, they can get online, watch the video, review the presentation, and provide input in the same way on an individual basis. Following your individual survey, you're going to work in, group, in small groups to have discussions about the components that Chief talks about here shortly and come to consensus at your table so that we can get kind of a group voice. After you've had a chance to talk about it as a group, what do you think has the highest impact in terms of safety and security? We've met with principals in our school district. We started off with a steering committee in our facilities master planning process with a little over 100 folks. Throughout the, what, seven or eight month period, we had consistently about 30 to 50 folks on that steering committee help to drive that process. And when we started with the safety and security planning process, a good number of them were ready to re-engage again. And so we called upon that steering committee, they've come back, and they're helping to guide this process as well. So we met with the steering committee, 
We met with principals. We have shared this information with the Board of Trustees during a workshop. We'll be taking it to our Academic Advisory Committee. We've had, this is our third of three community dialogue meetings. We met at Willow Ridge High School on Tuesday, at Clements High School last night, and now we're on uh, this side of the district getting input here. We'll go back to the steering committee once the survey online is closed, so we'll have your input, all of the live input, and then that from the uh, internet as well, to take back to the steering committee to then revise and complete the draft proposal to provide to the board for a workshop at the beginning of June, and then to recommend for their hopeful adoption at that second board meeting in June. We have a team that's behind the creation of this proposal that is going to be shared with you this evening and these options that will be explained. Several of our executive team members here in the district and folks in community relations have been involved and will continue to be involved along the way. And with that, I'm very happy to introduce to you Chief David Ryder. We'll be taking you down the road to understand the options that are in the plan. Thank you, Beth. Thank y'all for being here. Um, we, uh, we're happy to be here. Uh, I wish the group was, uh, it was a packed house, but uh, again, let's spread the word. Uh, my name is David Ryder, and uh, for the last four and a half years, I've been uh, the chief here at Fort Bend. Blessed to be here. Um, a little bit about me. I've spent the last 24 years in law enforcement, the last 18 in school district law enforcement. I spent 12 and a half years with Austin ISD uh, before coming here. So I've spent a great deal of time studying safety and security in the schools. And so what you're going to hear tonight, uh, we're going to start with a little bit of background. Uh, and that's going to entail some uh, life experience, some professional experience. Uh, it's based on best practices. It's based on industry standards. And then again, community engagement. So this is a critical piece of what we're trying to accomplish here at Fort Bend ISD. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about background, the um, Homeland Security uh, established the, uh, uh, the uh, Homeland Security Act of 2002, and it was in response to the 9-11 attacks. And basically what that did, it said that all the school districts were uh, now governmental entities. Well, what that means is that we have to follow all the rules that they set forth from the federal level as they apply to terrorism, because we all know that our schools are not exempt from terrorism. But, what I use, a term that I use in my department uh, quite often is, let's look at things from the 40,000 foot view. And so what I mean by that is, we tend to think of school violence as those shootings that happen across the country. While those are very tragic in nature, they don't happen very often, and that's the reality. Our schools are still some of the safest places to be. So what we want to do with this approach is take that 40,000 foot view and look at all the hazards that we might deal with, that we might come in contact with. So we have to plan for every hazard out there that's weather related, that's man-made, that's uh, natural disasters, terrorism, all those things. So we have to plan for all these in our safety and security plan. So while some of these do help deter and delay intruders in our buildings, some of them you're going to see help with weather situations. Some of them help with just visitor management on a daily basis because we have visitors coming to our campuses every single day. So that's what we're talking about with that 40,000 foot view. Every, every emergency plan is based on these four interrelated elements. There's infrastructure, what we build, what we put in place. There's crisis communication and notification, and those are two separate things. We're going to talk about that later. There's staffing. We have to have the right people in place to make the things happen. And then there are policies and procedures. We have to have it written down, we have to train on it, we have to drill. And if we don't have those written down, then it's not going to happen. So the first thing we're going to talk about is infrastructure. This is our first interrelated element. This is where the bulk of the plan comes in. So our infrastructure, if you think about it, are concentric circles or layers of protection. Okay. In other words, we want to put in a number of layers, layers upon layer upon layer upon layer of protection, so that um, if there is a break in one layer, it doesn't completely undo the plan. So when we talk about infrastructure, we're going to present it to you in terms of coming like, like you're a student on a school bus, and you're coming from your bus stop to the school. So you're going to see layer after layer after layer after layer as you go from the bus into your school. 
check, and that's how we want to approach this. The other thing that's important to talk about as we get uh, into this is each one of these are interrelated in some way. In other words, when we talk about safety and security, to me it's like a jigsaw puzzle. All right? And so if I just take one piece of a jigsaw puzzle out of a box, I can't get a good picture of what it's supposed to represent. All right? Well, you have to put those pieces together and make them fit before you can start to understand what that is supposed to look like. And sometimes we have jigsaw pieces that are in the right place, they're just not turned the right way. So sometimes we just have to spin them a little bit to get them to fit nicely uh, where they're supposed to be. That gives us that clear picture of safety and security in our buildings. So not one, one piece of this is not going to do it. We can't put one more officer in the school and that be the plan. It has to be a, a, a bunch of pieces uh, that fit together to make our security plan. So the first interrelated element are school bus cameras. Currently we have 467 buses in our fleet, 140 have uh, video capability on those buses, and the rest don't. And so when we buy new buses now, we buy buses that have video cameras on them. Okay? So through attrition, eventually we would get to that point. Do we want to wait that long, or do we want to go ahead and try to find funding where we can get video cameras on every bus very quickly? The, the benefits of having the video on the bus are uh, discipline, student discipline on the bus. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, a video of a bus and a bus driver in the route. Uh, sometimes they're, they're pretty, pretty loud and pretty chaotic. And that poor bus driver is having to focus on driving while students are in the back uh, bouncing up and down. Remember the, the song on the bus? So uh, it, it gets pretty chaotic at times. So video cameras help us with those discipline processes. Right now, our video system on the buses that we do have videos on, they're stored on a hard drive on the bus. So if we have to recover video from a bus, we have to go to the bus, remove the hard drive, plug it in, download the video, and then take that hard drive back to the bus. One of the things we would like to see happen, one of our goals, is to have a wireless capability on the bus on, and video on all of them so that when they come into uh, the back of Bowie Middle School here, and they hit the wireless network, it would automatically download all the recorded video since the last time it downloaded it into the server, and then our system administrator has access to that video instead of having to go and pull the hard drive. So that is one option that we can do. Uh, that is a goal. We want to move to that wireless capability and make it uh, much, much easier. Global positioning system or GPS traffic, uh, we would like to put on our buses in conjunction with the cameras. The GPS gives us uh, real-time data as to what the bus is doing, okay? We want to make sure that the bus, A, is obeying the speed limits, uh, but we also want to make sure that they're on the right routes, that they stop at the right places. We have parents that uh, call and say, hey, the bus didn't pick my child up, never made it here or the bus just drove right past and didn't stop. Well, we don't have any way to, to track that. So with GPS, we would be able to, to go back and look at, the, look at the software and say, that bus stopped, and it stopped for 35 seconds. Well, that bus was traveling 18 miles an hour when it passed this place or this point in time. And so that gives us real good information uh, to move forward. You're going to see some other places in here where GPS is going to help us out tremendously, and again, as these dovetail and integrate. Currently, we have no GPS tracking on any of our buses. No GPS tracking. So, GPS comes in a live mode where our system administrator can see what's going on right then and there, and it comes in what's called a breadcrumb mode. And the breadcrumb mode gives us a slice or a piece in time, a snapshot, basically, and then we put all those snapshots together to see what happened, but it doesn't give you a continual time. And there are costs associated with those. And as I mentioned cost, we purposely don't put cost in these presentations for the community. And the reason is we don't want you to think, well, that's too much for my school or not enough for this school. We want to create a standard for all of our schools. I don't care where the students go in this district, they should all have the same level of protection. They should all have the same safety and security services. And so Whatever the standard is that we decide to come up with, then that's what we need to have across the board. 
And so then we'll worry about how to fund it. So, so the, the purpose of this is to create those standards. Okay, our next interrelated element, our, our next uh, infrastructure related element are security camera systems. Currently, every school uh, has their own video camera system, and it's a decentralized system. That means that each system resides within that school. And so our dispatcher and system administrators, principals, and other folks, they have access to log into those cameras to look at them. But we have a system right now that even though we have these uh, uh, cameras all over the place, you have to log in to a server and you can see 12 cameras or 16. 16 cameras, thank you. Steve is our emergency management coordinator. Um, so log, you can log in and you can see 16 cameras, but you can't go past that. So if there are 48 cameras on a campus, if you don't see the camera that you want to see on that one, you have to log out, log back into another server, and look at the next bank of 16 cameras. Well, you can see that's going to get pretty cumbersome. And when you're talking about over 2,300 cameras in the district right now, and we really need to be up to about 7,000, logging in to look at 16 cameras at a time is going to get pretty cumbersome. So what we want to do is look at the, uh, the option of moving to a centralized camera system where all the cameras download into one central location, which will be in our IT facility downtown, have a redundant backup place, and then our system administrators can look at those cameras, log in one time, and then you can pick where you need to go from there. So, the other thing we have right now is we use analog technology for most of our cameras. Analog technology, you probably notice this when you zoom in on a picture and it gets real grainy, and so what we want to do is use um, is move away from analog and move towards IP cameras, internet protocol cameras. They're a much, uh, much they give us a much better image quality. And so when we talk about image quality, uh, as as we started this process, we thought about well our standard. And we talked about that standard across the district. Our standard should be 150 cameras at a at a high school or 125 at a middle school. Well, really now as we start to explore these options. I think image quality becomes more important than the number of cameras we have. So if we have evidence area quality, uh, image quality at the front doors, the back doors, the visitor management areas, that's much more important to us than 150 cameras on a campus that don't have very good image quality. So there are a number of options that we're exploring, but we want to hear from you. Are cameras worth investing? And so that's, that's one of the options that's in front of you tonight. The next one is security fencing. Security fencing gets a lot of attention. Um, we have campuses in this district that have no fencing around the playgrounds, around the portable buildings. Uh, we have, we've heard um, that some places want fencing around the parking lots, but we can't close off those uh, because we have cars going in and out. So what is practical? Okay, when we start talking about fencing, what is practical? We know because we've done the site maps or we've done the walk uh, before these presentations, I have 41 elementary campuses that need over 36,000 linear feet of fence. We've got 11 middle schools that need over 33,000 linear feet of fence and 11 high schools that need over 65,000 linear feet of fence. So the question becomes, what, fence, what kind of fence? And if we're, that's over 20 miles of fence. And so if we put 20 miles of chain link fence on our campuses, that's another, that, that's an additional 20 miles of weed eating, whether mechanically or chemically. That's 20 miles of picking up trash that gets blown and caught at the bottom. Okay? So we need to think ahead with that. Or are we going to do ornamental fencing? Well, ornamental fencing is a whole lot more expensive than chain link, but do we want chain link fence around our schools? I don't want our schools to look like that. That's my personal opinion. But that may be the way we have to go. So we want to hear from you. Is it important enough that we put fencing around the campuses and around certain areas of the campus? Playgrounds, uh, 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 portable buildings, things like that. Okay? Video intercom. Video intercoms, you can see a picture there, it allows the staff members to see who's at the door before they let them in. This is a component to our visitor management system, to our visitor management process. So the video intercoms, we, uh, 
We are thinking about uh, putting one at the front door of every elementary school because our elementaries are a single uh, point of entry only, should be. Uh, the back door should be locked, the side door should be locked, everybody should funnel in through the front. During the summertime, uh, we have limited staff in the building, so when a visitor comes up and they can't get in because we don't want people just walking through the school, they can use the video intercom. Now somebody in the office can see them, they can, they can talk with them, and maybe say, show me your ID, or whatever the case may be, and then buzz them in. It is a component to the visitor management system. At middle schools and high schools, we know that students have a lot more mobility, so we would probably end up putting video intercoms at multiple locations around the school, on maybe the back doors here at the middle schools and the front door, uh, something along those lines. But those would uh, assist us with our visitor management. The uh, next piece of the puzzle is access control. Each one of the employees in Forbin ISD has an access control card, just like I'm wearing here. And you'll notice the black boxes that are uh, on the doors, uh, on the exterior doors mostly around our schools. Those are our access control boxes. And so they're uh, radio frequency. When you go up and you scan them, you probably have them at work, and they open the door for you. We want to install more of these around the district, and here's why. We have 10,000 employees in the district, and when we make keys, for those employees, when they get hired, and they work here for a number of years, and then leave, if there are keys missing off that key ring, A, how are we going to know, and B, where did they go? And so inventory control of keys is a big issue. And so I don't want, as the chief, I don't want uh, master keys floating around that we have no control over. That somebody can come up here in the evenings, or on weekends, or over the summer, and use a master key to open the building. So inventory control for keys is a big deal for us. Using the card access, uh, Mr. Dancer and, and his emergency management coordinator, uh, their group, they can program every single car to open certain doors. They give it permissions. Now when I open this door, every time I use my card, it records my name, the date, and the time that I swipe my card. It is a great um, tool to be able to see whose card is being used if we have an issue at a campus. Who went in the building? Who didn't go in the building? When an employee doesn't work there anymore, we can go in there and very quickly deactivate the card and then it doesn't work. And there's no keys to mess with and their card just simply doesn't work anymore. So, we would like to install more uh, card access points around the buildings. Um, we also program those at high schools where they can change classes and go from out classes to inside the building and vice versa so that those doors stay open during a certain time period. But then after the, after the class change, those doors lock. And so now those doors remain shut and they're locked and so the students can't get in. That's where the video intercom would come in. So that would, that's just another example of that. Um, we want to standardize a number of these that we use for each school in the future, and we want to put them on uh, certain locations like the vault. Uh, we have a number of issues with, you know, keys to the vault, and all of a sudden the PTA money is missing, or something like that. So we want to make sure that this gives us good control over the vault, maybe computer labs, where we have uh, a lot of equipment that our taxpayers are buying for the schools, uh, maybe the IDF, MDF rooms, those are where we store cameras, systems, computers. So there are a number of there are a number of places we can use these cards. <clears throat> security vestibules. Much like what you see here, this is a newer school, so we have a very nice security vestibule built in here. Um, we want to outfit the rest of our schools with these, the schools that don't have security vestibules. Uh, this again helps with our visitor management system. So a security vestibule is, going to, is at the building entrance. It gives us a place for our visitors to come in out of the weather, and it gives us a place for our front office staff to manage those visitors before they go into the building. Okay, a lot. Some of our schools don't have that. So we have 42 campuses uh, that we need to install a security vestibule in, and we have another 29, and I think the number may be up to 32 now that uh, I heard today that um, need some type of renovation to their security vestibule. An example of a renovation, you might have a front office desk where your, your front office staff sits behind the desk, but there's no 
glass or plexiglass or anything over it. And so if we did have an intruder, they could simply jump the desk and now they're into the building. Here, you can't do that, okay? Because there's a sliding glass window and there's, it's really gonna be difficult to get through that. Now, we do want to improve on that. And I'm gonna tell you about that here in just a minute. So our goal is to install security vestibules at every campus and to improve on the, uh, the, the security vestibules that we have. So impact resistant window film. This ties in nicely with our security vestibules. We saw in Sandy Hook where the, uh, the shooter there at Sandy Hook shot through a glass window and walked into the school because the front doors were locked. So what we want to do is explore the idea of putting impact resistant window film on our security vestibules, on our doors, on our front doors, on these back doors. Now, when we talk about bulletproof glass, we hear a lot about that, bulletproof glass, that's a very, very thick glass that um, usually the president uses. Um, but if you talk about window film, bulletproof window film, it's very, very thick. You can apply it to the windows, but it's very difficult to see through. It's very, it's kind of like that frosted shower glass. Because it's so thick and because it has so much property in it, it's very difficult to see through. That defeats the purpose of our front office staff and our visitors being able to see through. So what we want to do is put a hurricane rated window film on these, on these vestibules and on our doors. And the reality is we're much more likely to have a weather related event in our schools than we are an active shooter. That's, I mean, that's the reality. Uh, we deal with hurricanes and tornadoes and flooding and things like that uh, on a regular basis. Our hurricane rated window film is built, made to withstand uh, two by fours, tree limbs, hammers, things like that that are flying through the air in hurricane force winds, and it won't shatter and break. It'll it'll smash like that, but it won't fall apart. And that's what we want. We want something that's going to deter and delay somebody who's trying to break through that glass. They're not going to be able to hit it one time and walk through it. It, it would take them. Uh, minutes upon minutes to be able to make a hole in that. So that's exactly what we want. Um, so I think the hurricane rated film would work would work for us. Our goal is to add that to our exterior windows, exterior doors, and the reason we want to put it at the doors, like at the end of the hallway, again, if we have a tornado uh, or a hurricane coming this way, we've had tornadoes that were spotted in four and a half years I've been here, a short amount of time. We've been out and had tornadoes on the ground, and they're headed towards different schools. And so we move those students, we have what's called a two-wall rule, and we move them out of the classrooms, and we put two walls between them and the exterior walls of the schools. Well, that means they're going to be in a hallway, more than likely. And if we put them in a hallway, and we don't bolster our windows down at the ends of the hallway, and they break, now they're, they're in, in harm's way. So we want to definitely secure those windows at the end of the hallway. Radio frequency identification technology. This is RFID. You may have heard about this, and it's something we're exploring. Not many school districts use this. I'll preface that up front. Uh, there, there are some, uh, there are some concerns with RFID. However, uh, it does have some good practical uses, and so we want to explore that option. RFID technology is embedded in the cards that we could use as ID cards and swipe cards to get in the building, the access cards that we talked about. RFID works off a wireless network, okay? And the, um, let's start with the teachers. The teachers could have um, special cards that have three buttons, push buttons, that are built into the card. You can't see them, you can't see them but you can feel them on the back. And so if you push them in a certain order, they send an alert signal to our system administrator. That could be the principal at the school, that could be the dispatcher, it could be whoever we assign, or multiple people. So your car is reading off the wireless networks, and so as you move through the school and everything is fine, if you're looking at the map of the school, you would be able to see the car flashing green. Okay? It doesn't tell you exactly where the person is, it gives you a general location, whatever the closest uh, internet port they're reading off of. So if they push the buttons, if the teacher pushes the button, let's say they have an irate parent in the classroom. Let's say somebody is uh, a student is dumping desk over in their classroom and they need help in their classroom. They can push the button on their car just that quick, just like I, I, I just did, 
and it's sending an alert already to our administrator or to the dispatcher, and we can get help to them very, very quickly. And we know generally where they're at. Now, for students in the student application, we're talking about using RFID uh, technology in the student IDs and having a district-wide ID policy for all the students. Now, the students, their cars would not have the emergency buttons on them because we certainly don't want 71,000 kids trying to figure out the buttons. Uh, but our students would have the RFID technology, and so they're reading as well. Well, if you're assigned to one campus, your car is supposed to read to that campus. If you go to another campus, your card is not supposed to read there and it's going to flash red. And it's going to send an alert to the system administrator, somebody's on the campus that's not supposed to be. Okay? That's one advantage. Another advantage to, to me that's huge is we do drills. We do fire drills. We're required by law to do a fire drill every single month. Okay? So when our administrators conduct their fire drill and we want to make sure everybody's getting out of the building, very quickly, they can look at the screen and see if any green cards are flashing in that building. Now we know a general location about where somebody might be in the library and they just didn't want to leave. They might be in a, uh, a boys' restroom or a girls' restroom and they didn't want to leave the building. They might just be in class. And they might just have their car in their backpack in their locker. That would be something we need to know too. So very quickly, our system administrators could look at a computer screen and see if everybody's out of the building instead of getting into the habit of walking around and checking, because we're gonna do what we're trained to do. And so in a real fire, in a real evacuation, we're gonna have principals that evacuate, and then they go around and walk when they should be outside, okay? They should, they should not have to go around and look for people in the building. This gives us a real-time, very quick uh, snapshot of who may still be in the building. RFID technology can be used with the student uh, cards as well. It has a barcode. We can put a barcode on the back, and we can use it in the cafeteria lines. We all know that cafeteria times, are, our lunch times are short for the students. They have to get in here, eat, and get back. And so when you have 100 kids going through the lunch line, it takes some time for the cafeteria worker to ring that up, to make the exchange. And so our RFID cards can be used to swipe right there, almost like a debit card, and it deducts from their account, it's tied to their account, it would deduct from that student's account, and they just keep on moving through the lunch line. Okay, so we speed up our time. The other thing that we can use RFID for are buses. We don't know right now, unless the bus driver knows all the students that are on that bus manifest uh, right at the beginning of school, we don't know uh, who's getting on the bus, if they're supposed to be on there, and who's not. So our RFID technology can be used when the students get on the bus, they swipe it. If it turns green, they're supposed to be on that bus. We can program it that way. When they get off the bus, they swipe it, and now we know where they got off. Now, uh, if it turns red, the bus driver says, you're not supposed to be on this bus, you don't ride this bus. Now we can keep things from happening from people that are not supposed to be on the bus. Another benefit of that is, I know it's hard to believe, but the first week of school every year, every single day, we have about 15 elementary school kids that don't make it home. They bless their hearts. They get on the wrong bus or they get off at the wrong stop. And so usually about 4 o'clock in the afternoon is when we start getting frantic phone calls from uh, frantic parents that are worried sick about their babies who haven't made it off the bus. And we stay out until whatever time we have to stay out till to find those students. And 99.999% of the time, they're found safe and they're fine. However, the process that we have to go through is now we're having to call the bus driver at home and say, I know it's the first week of school, but do you remember a kid, kindergarten, maybe first grade, may have been wearing this, may have been riding your bus, do you happen to remember what stop they got off on? Well, there's 48 kids on the bus. How are they going to remember that? And that is how we have to start looking for those students. So if we have that GPS technology on the bus, the RFID that tells us where they got on and off the bus, we can very quickly find them, or very quickly start looking for them in a certain place. Another thing RFID does, when you get to your school, now this is only going to read in our network, okay? So when you're out 
away from the school, it's not going to read on anybody else's network. It's going to read just on the school district's network. So it doesn't matter at home. It's not going to do anything. It doesn't know to, to talk to your, to your network at home. But what we can make it do is when your student shows up at school, you get an alert. Your student's in school. When they walk away from school, you get an alert. They're not on campus anymore. When they get on the bus, you get an alert. Your student's on the bus. When they get off the bus, you get an alert. Your student is now off the bus. Okay? That's good information to know as a parent. Okay? Now, I think so. That's good information to know as a parent. RFID, what else? We can use RFID for asset tags. We put a lot of money into our schools, and we're going to continue to put money into our schools. We just passed, a, or just approved a facilities master plan. We're about to start working on the technology master plan. And so we're about to put a lot of money into our schools in infrastructure. We have computers, we have uh, monitors, we have projectors. Those things are expensive. And taxpayers don't like to have to keep replacing them when they keep walking off. So one of the things we can do with the RFID are attach asset tags to these assets. And they're tied in to the closest wireless network. And when they leave, when they magically grow legs and walk off, then we get an alert right then and there. So you can imagine a classroom in uh, a high school is vacant for two and a half months during the summer. Teacher comes back, computer's missing. Well, now we have to go back and try to find out from two and a half months ago at what point in time did that computer walk off. Very, very difficult to do. Very low chance of finding it. If we have asset tags on there that are attached to the uh, RFID network, then as soon as that computer leaves that area, that 100 feet radius or the 400 foot radius, whatever it is, we get an alert. Now we can pull that up in conjunction with our cameras. We have a date and a time. We know when, and now we know who is in the area. Okay. So RFID is very, very valuable to us uh, in terms of not losing property. Wireless network coverage. You've heard me talk about wireless network. And we'll continue to talk about wireless, but this is one of those pieces of infrastructure that we need to bolster. We don't have 100% wireless network at all of our schools, and we need to. And there are some reasons we're going to talk about this in just a minute. Uh, we've already talked about some of them, but we're going to talk about some more. So that's one of the options that we want to explore is 100% wireless network at school. Our crisis communication and notification. This is our second related, uh, our second interrelated element in our in our plan. So we talked about infrastructure. Now we want to talk about communication and notification. Those are two separate things. So let's start with communication first. It is critically important that we be able to communicate with our staff in a crisis. If we don't have that ability, then we've lost uh, most of the battle already. So we want to build in some redundant communication and notification systems so that we can be able to do that. The first thing that we're exploring is a, an emergency communication system. Now, we can buy radios for the teachers, but that means they're going to have to carry around a handheld radio and walk with that everywhere they go. And the radio frequencies that you're going to see here in a little bit, radio frequencies are being squeezed down. We're going to talk about that in, in a few minutes. So, Radios are, we're going to have to find an alternative measure to those. This, these, these do it for us. Now, this crisis communication system that we're talking about, there are two of them on the market that we've already started exploring. One of them, I'll tell you, and they both attach to a lanyard. So most of our teachers wear a lanyard with a room key on it or their ID or something. They're already wearing that lanyard. It's not anything that's cumbersome. They don't have to carry it around. This clips to the lanyard, and it just literally hangs right here in the middle, okay? The first one that I'll talk to you about is um, a product that is an audio enhancement device as well as an emergency communication device. So what I mean by that, glad you asked. Teacher standing in front of the classroom, okay, talking to the class, just like I'm talking in a regular voice. Everybody in the back can hear just as well as all the students in the front. I think that's important because our teachers don't need to be yelling to reach the kids in the back because the kids in the front are always getting yelled at, okay? And if they talk to the kids in the front, the, the kids in the back don't hear. So in our classroom, we can, we can have our teachers wear this audio enhancement device that ties into the speaker in the classroom, 
And when the teacher is talking, everybody in the classroom can hear. Cuts down on the yelling and allows every student to hear at the same level. The other thing that it does, it has an emergency button on it. And so when a teacher hears something outside the room, a student gets upset in the room, whatever the case may be, they can push the emergency button just like that and it sets off an emergency uh, alert to our system administrator. It doesn't make a noise, so nobody knows that that teacher's pushed it, but it sends a, it sends a message to our system administrator. It pulls a, a screen up on the computer and it even can attach to a camera and start camera recording at that location if we wanted to. So the teacher, what we will do, if this is the option we go, is train them to start talking. Because now when they push that, we can hear what they're saying. And so if they have somebody outside the room trying to get in, they can tell us, I'm in room 312, somebody's trying to get into my room. Or I have an irate parent in my class, I need help. Something. And that gives us information that's very, very critical, and they can tell us where they are so we can go straight to that classroom instead of having to look around the school and figure out where they're at. The other device that's a crisis communication device, do you remember having pagers about 10 years ago? Uh, they were about an inch by two inches. We don't, nobody carries pagers anymore. It's about the size of a pager, maybe a little smaller, and, and it's a product that, that also clips onto the lanyard, but it is an actual two-way radio and it has programmable talk groups in it. And so we can program teachers to be able to talk to other teachers. We can program teachers to be able to talk to administrators, okay? And we can program, and we can program uh, them, all those, to be able to talk to our police channel, okay? So what, how does that work? Well, first of all, again, they work off the wireless network. So when a teacher takes their class outside on the playground, they have that radio capability with them already. They don't have to remember to pick up a radio and walk out with it. They don't have to rely on cell phone coverage. Uh, they have that radio capability with them right then and there. When they go to the car rider line, they already have it with them. When they go to the bus ramp, they already have it with them. No matter where they're at in the schools, we have that 100% wireless coverage, then they have access, emergency access to somebody. Okay? That's very important for our elementary schools because we don't have officers stationed at the elementary schools. And so I want to make sure that our elementary schools feel like they have uh, extra layers of protection for those teachers that don't have immediate access to an officer on that campus, okay? So that crisis communication device has an emergency button on it as well. Uh, they can push that and they can talk to us, our officers, as we're responding there, and they can give us real-time information, what's going on, where are you, and we can have a two-way conversation with them while they are in their room or on the playground or whatever the case may be. Valuable, valuable information. Okay, an emergency notification system. This is slightly different. There's no communication back and forth. We are going to send a message to a school or to a group of schools. They're going to get that information and then they're going to act on it. So, how does that work? There are LED message boards. Last night we were at Clemens High School and they have message boards in their cafeterias. Okay, they're always scrolling the message. We tie into those or we put our own in. Um, there are uh, different uh, panels that you can put in the main office that has a strobe light, much like a fire alarm, a strobe light with a message board on it. Uh, some of the systems require you to push a button and acknowledge that you got the message. But let's use the scenario of a tornado. We have severe weather in the area, or a tornado has been spotted on one side of the county, one side of the school district, and it's moving towards schools. Here's how we handle it right now. My dispatcher picks up the phone and starts calling every school in the area that that tornado is heading. It's gonna take time to call 15 schools in that area, okay? So this message board, this, this alert system, would allow us to type in a message and tell them severe weather headed your way, tornado headed your way, go shelter in place. Send, all of them get it at one time, okay? Very, very critical, very valuable. Uh, much faster than a phone tree, 
Um, and some of them, again, require that acknowledgement. They hit acknowledge. We know they got it. Now, we can start sending resources to that area if we can, if we can move. Sometimes we're stuck until, until the weather blows over. But at least we can start sending mess, uh, resources to that area. Okay. Our two-way radio replacement. Um, love the government, uh, but they put uh, an unfunded mandate out there. I know that's hard to believe, but they didn't fund things they told us we had to do. But there was an unfunded mandate that said by 2013 we had to switch all of our first responder radios over to a digital system, what we call an Apex radio. All right? What they're doing is a narrow band uh, operation where they're squeezing all the radio channels down into one pipe, and into a small band, a narrow band, which means they can get more radio frequencies in that band and sell more radios and cell phones and things like that. Well, that means that the way our radios operate have to change. That mandate was supposed to take place in 2013, but what they realized was uh, a number of volunteer firemen, uh, small police departments, small ambulance services, things like that, were about to go out of business because they did not have the money to change all their radios. Okay, So they were about to go out of business. So the FCC said, okay, we can't have that happen. So they said, now you have until 2017, but we mean it this time. So uh, what we've done in our police department is every time we hire a new officer or every time we have to replace a radio, we, have still, we buy a new radio. And so we've already started that process. But all of those transportation radios need to be replaced as well. And that's why when we talk about having those radios for the teachers, that would be a big deal now. Okay? So we have to find that alternative measure, which is that crisis communication device we talked about earlier. So uh, we have until 2017 to switch our radios over, and we're in the process of doing that. You need to know that, uh, but we're going to have to start thinking about alternative funding or how we're going to fund that in about 2015 to 2016. Okay, staffing. This is our third interrelated element. We have to have the right people in place to get the job done. And so our superintendent, uh, is um, very, very much aware of safety and security, very supportive. Uh, I love that about him. And uh, he helped us create an emergency management coordinator. Now, this is part of our overall safety and security plan. This is not something that you'll have to worry about on the survey because it's already done. But it's important for you to know that. Steve Dancer is our emergency management coordinator. Uh, Wave Steve. And uh, Steve. Uh, already worked in the district, but he's a, a, over 30 years uh, as a retired firefighter out of Houston and well versed in emergency management. Most cities, counties, and big school districts have their own emergency management coordinator, and we did. So one of the things that the superintendent said was, let's do it. And we did. And so since January, uh, Steve has been working very, very hard on getting training out to our campuses, making sure the emergency operation plans that are required for each campus are up to date and, and the best they can be because that keeps our kids safe. Um, he works on a number of projects and so uh, Steve is, is very, very busy right now and we are putting out lots of training um, and, and there's a lot more to come. The other person that's already in place is a life safety systems manager. Life safety systems include all the burglar alarm systems, fire alarm systems, card access systems, uh, security camera systems, the hood vents in the kitchens, fire extinguisher prevention and maintenance and replacement systems. Uh, anything having to do with those life safety systems, Mr. Ernie Rodriguez is now in charge of. And so uh, he has quite a daunting task when we start talking about doubling the number of cameras in the district. That all falls under life safety. When we start talking about adding more card access, that falls under life safety. And so he's responsible for managing all those systems, making sure there's contracts with our outside vendors are in place so that when they go down, we can get them fixed very, very quickly. We certainly don't want a fire system or a burglar alarm system to move down. So those are already in place. Now, one of the things that we do want to put in place is an emergency management liaison. And this is one person identified at every campus, it takes no additional staffing. One person identified at every campus that would act as a liaison between Mr. Dancer and that campus. So instead of trying to find somebody on the campus that can help us get a tabletop presentation together or to help conduct the security audit at our campus or to do whatever with emergency management, this would be one person that's assigned to 
to kind of help uh, Steve and be our voice of emergency management on that campus. Um, kind of a one-stop one shop there. But you can imagine with 74 campuses, that's 74 people he has to deal with. Uh, but it's better than trying to have three or four or five people on each campus that might be doing it today and, or, or not tomorrow. So uh, that's, that's one thing that, uh, that we're going to start putting in place. Again, it requires no additional staff, no additional funding. Uh, it's just a good, good practice to have. We talk about our police patrol operation. For Ben ISD police, we have 48 police officers. The board just approved six more. Five of those are going to be second SROs at the high schools, school resource officers at the high schools that only have one uh, officer assigned to the high school. So the, our standard will be that every high school has two officers assigned to it. Geographically, those schools are bigger. We have student parking lots. We have administrative parking lots. We have athletic fields. We just have more land to cover, more stories, more, more people. So two officers is going to be the standard at the high school, one officer at every uh, middle school. Right now, we don't have a full-time patrol operation. And so uh, what does that mean to you as a taxpayer? Well, uh, we answer over 30,000 calls for service last year with 48 people. Over 30,000 calls for service. Our officers get off work basically at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon is when the last one gets off work and the first one comes in basically at about 7 in the morning. There's some variances in there just because of start times for schools. But basically, if you look at it from 5 in the afternoon until 7 in the morning, we don't have anybody scheduled to work. And yet we cover 177 square miles. We're the seventh largest district in the state and we have all these schools that are left unprotected. So, what we want to do is put in a full-time patrol division. Last year in 2013, we had 2,013 alarms in our schools. Burglar alarms, fire alarms. Okay? Uh, it just happened to be that the total number of alarms was exactly the, the year. Uh, so, I hope that trend doesn't continue. <laughs> but, we have uh, a number of alarms, and right now, what we have to do is if those alarms come in after hours, we have to send another agency, the Sheriff's Department, Sugar Land, Missouri City, whoever is in that jurisdiction, to those alarms. Well, those folks don't have keys to our building. They don't have card access. They don't have an alarm code, even if they could get in. So basically, they're going to drive around through the back, and if they don't see a broken window with a big neon sign that says, I'm a burglar and I broke in right here, they're not going to get out and do much. Bless their heart, they're just not going to do it. And so our property is not protected the way I would like it to be as your chief, okay? So, if we have an officer working, that means they're working overtime aside from somewhere. After 5 o'clock, they're working a football game, they're working a basketball game, they're working a choir event, they're working a fine art event, somewhere in the district. If they're working, they're working overtime somewhere. So, if we have, um, remember those 31,000 calls for service that I said we had last year? 38% of those came in after 5 in the afternoon and before 7 in the morning. 38% come in when we don't have anybody scheduled to work. Those are those kids that don't show up at home. And all of a sudden, my kid is missing. Those are the ones where the kid gets home and says, well, I got into a show and match with so-and-so at school, and now mom wants to file an assault report. Those are the ones where the kid comes home and their cell phone is missing out of their backpack, and now mom wants to file a report. Okay? Those are the type of things that we have, and it happens every single day. We have 70,000 students. You know, crime doesn't stop at 5 o'clock. I wish it did, but it doesn't. And so we have to answer those calls after hours because Sugarland Police, and Missouri City Police, and the Sheriff's Department, as soon as they hear the word school, they're sending them right to us. All right, so what we have to do is send an officer that's supposed to be working a, a volleyball game or a baseball game or a fine arts event. We have to take them away from that to go answer that call for service. Now, they're supposed to be their, their own contract to work over here but we have to pull them to go answer that call for our stakeholders, for our, for our parents, okay, for our students. It's just not a good situation to be in, but we do what we have to do because I certainly don't want to tell a parent, wait till tomorrow and talk to the officer at the school. That's not good customer service. I don't believe in that, okay? So, here's what we want to do. We can hire 14 officers, 12, 12 officers and two sergeants. We have to have supervision, one on evenings, one on nights, but we can provide a full-time patrol for our stakeholders with 14 people. <clears throat> that doesn't sound like a lot, and it's not a lot. I'd love to have more, but this is our minimum, okay? So, 
we put six of them on day shift, and then what those day shift officers will be responsible for are geographic areas and focus on the elementary schools in that area. We already have officers in the middle schools. We already have officers in the high schools now. Okay, built in, we'll have two there. And so our patrol officers will focus on elementary campuses. And so they're going to provide them that coverage that they haven't had. Right now, our middle school officers and our high school officers have to leave here to go check on Pecan Grove, or leave here and go check on Oakland, or leave here and go check on elementaries. And so that leaves this campus uncovered. And that's not a good situation to be in either. We don't want to leave any campus uncovered. So with a full-time patrol operation, we can send our patrol officers who are mobile to those campuses. The other thing that we'll be able to do is interact with those elementary school kids in a meaningful way. My belief is if we want to change the culture of school violence, we have to start with the elementary and get them to understand how to deal with anger. And then as they move to middle schools and high schools, it will eventually change that culture of violence. If we start with middle schools and high schools, then they're already, uh, they're, they're already in a different mode, they're already in a different mentality. So I think we need to start at the elementary levels. This allows our officers to get into the elementaries uh, much better. Evening shift, we have extended day and extended day service. Uh, many parents use, we have over 3,300 students in extended day at all of our elementaries. They stay there until 6.30 in the evening. We have no patrol officers to provide protection for those elementary school campuses. The other thing I found out last night, and this is a, this, this changes, but the other thing I found out last night was that starting next year, all of the kids, the middle school and high school kids that go to academies are going to be picked up on buses from elementary campuses. So they're going to, the academy students are going to go to the elementary schools and be picked up from there, bus to their academy, and then when they come home in the afternoon, they're going to be dropped off at the elementary campuses. So now we're going to have middle school and high school students on our elementary campuses right about the time the elementary are going to be getting out. There's going to be some delay there, so they don't completely overlap, but that's another good reason for us to have patrol officers to be able to go check on those elementary schools. Okay? Um, again, we have late calls for service, and our, our evening shift patrol officers will be able to handle those without having to pay for overtime for officers. And then on night shift, we answer all those alarms. Those are media officers that go and answer those alarms. Right now, we get charged by the other agencies when they come and answer our alarms. So, uh, I have to pay them 100 bucks a pop every time they come and answer our alarms. Now, we had 2013 alarms. So, it, it, it's beneficial to us to have a night shift patrol. Uh, and we also know that from a deterrent standpoint, burglaries go down when they see officers drive around the schools frequently. Because burglars like to case out their locations where they want to, they know we've got a lot of nice equipment in our schools. During the summertime, all of our officers come in and work patrol. From the day school gets out till the day before school starts, all of our Fortnite ISD officers come in and they are assigned a patrol shift. And we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, full-time patrol during the summer. In 2013, we, 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 um, conducted over 14,400 close patrols and foot patrols of our own buildings. We don't have 74 schools, but we did over 14,400 foot patrols of people getting out, driving around our car, uh, driving around our buildings, and looking at our properties and making sure everything's safe there. Now, that is something that we can control from an internal standpoint, and that's a lot of eyes on our buildings all day long during the summer. The result of that is we had one burglary over the summertime and we caught them because we had people out and they're mobile and they were there. So it was it's effective. We know it's effective. So uh, full-time patrol, again, 12 officers, two sergeants, we can make it happen. Threat assessment teams. This is um, something we don't have in place now, but a threat assessment team would be made up of maybe the officer, the nurse, a counselor, a mental health professional, uh, administrator. And what the threat assessment team will do is we have the students who turn in disturbing artwork or they write an essay and it's kind of concerning. And so the teacher comes to the counselor and says, what should I do with this? That's where the threat assessment team comes in. We want to make sure that these students who are exhibiting these signs uh, right off the bat get the help and the support they need. 
And so our threat assessment team would be able to meet and be able to talk from many different disciplines. Everybody brings a different, a, a different viewpoint to the table. And we would be able to decide what is most important. What, how can we get the, the best resources for that student to help them deal with that, with that issue that, that they're exhibiting, whatever it may be. And so our threat assessment team takes no additional staff. It's an easy thing to put into place, but it is part of our safety and security plan. Um, to, to make sure that uh, we're doing our part from a police standpoint, this summer, every single one of our Fort Bend ISD officers are going through a 40-hour mental health officer certification course. And so each one of our officers will be certified as a mental health officer and be able to recognize behaviors um, and language that may be conducive to violence. Okay? And we would be able to ask the right questions, get the right help, and be, be a productive part of that threat assessment team. Procedures. This is our fourth and related element, and it's pretty short, but here's the thing. Established written procedures are paramount. If we don't have those, our plan is not going to be carried out. But one of the things that we, um, the first thing that we have are emergency operation plans. These are required by law, and every single campus has an emergency operation plan. And I may say EOP, I sometimes get hung up on acronyms, but that's an emergency operation plan. These are required. Our, uh, they, they cover the four phases of emergency management. Um, the prevention and mitigation, how do, we, how do we make sure that we build things so that crime won't happen. The uh, planning phase, when something does happen, what are we planning for to get through the next part. The response phase, how do we get people there to help. And then the recovery phase, how do we get past this and how do we make sure it doesn't happen again. And then it's just a continuous circle. Because once we get to the recovery phase, we got to start planning and, and for the next. Okay, so that's emergency management really in a nutshell. And so each one of our emergency operation plans defines that. And again, it's an all hazard approach. It also defines all the roles and responsibilities for everybody that has a part in that emergency operation plan. It builds in redundancy to each one of those pieces. And then those things are audited by Steve uh, every three years by law. We'll talk about that. So again, this is part of our overall safety and security. It's not something you have to worry about. It's something we already do, but it's something our standard response protocol, uh, we are working on implementing this now. This is a, um, this is a, a, a very simple, uh, easy way to get information out to our students on what to do in a crisis, what to do in an emergency. There are basically four words that they have to remember. Lock down, lock out, evacuate, and shelter. And so what we would do is train our staff and our students on those four things because pretty much in every emergency situation, you're gonna do one of those. And so if we can teach them very quickly what to do and how to do it in each one of those four phases, then all we have to do is say one word and they know exactly what to do. It's very simple. And it provides consistency from an elementary school level all the way through their educational career through the high school level. All the teachers hear the same thing, they're trained the same way, and the best part is, it's free. So. Uh, the, the information is on the internet. This was designed by a father from Platte Canyon High School in Colorado whose daughter was taken hostage in a school and she was killed during the school day. Okay? And they did not have the, uh, the standard response protocols in place then. He created these afterwards so that everybody would know what to do very quickly uh, in a situation like that. So that's where this came from. Very, very important, and it's easy to put in place. No additional staff is necessary. Safety and security audits. Again, each one of our emergency operation plans has to be audited by law every three years. Uh, Steve is a pretty smart guy. He doesn't do all 74 of them in the last year of the audit cycle. Uh, he breaks them up into thirds and does one third one year, the second third the next year, and the last third this year, this year. And here's why. We have a very extensive audit tool. We have over 200 audit questions on that. And we check the interior security, we check the exterior security, and we check the leadership and how much they are aware of security on their campus. What certifications do they have? How much training do they have? Do we need to get them more training? That's all part of the emergency operation plan, not just the physical part of the building. And so when we talk about the emergency operation plans, it's very inclusive. Um, uh, best practices, again, we use over 200 audit questions on that and they're, they're completed every three years. And 
so now I'll turn it back over to Beth for uh, her to talk about the community engagement piece. Thank you. Like I said in the beginning, your voice is critical. The voice of the community is critical as we uh, move forward in this planning process. We've presented to several stakeholder groups already. Uh, we still have a couple of steps to go, taking that input back to the steering committee and then back to the board for information and then to the board for a recommendation to adopt the, the proposal, which will serve as a guide as we move forward and plan and correct some actions, put some options in place for safety and security for our students. After tonight's meeting, we're going to put that link out to the community, but tonight we need for you to first provide your individual input. So a survey is coming around, you can just use uh, a pencil, we have pencils too, uh, or a pen, doesn't matter, we're going to score these by hand or put these into the system by hand. As you rank your opinion, please remember what Chief said about the 40,000 foot view. Not, don't, not, don't think about it as Bowie Middle School or Pecan Grove Elementary or Travis High School. Think about it in terms of the whole district. So as a standard for the whole district, what impact does each one of those interrelated components have on the safety and security of students and staff? Don't get, don't get caught up thinking, oh, but my school doesn't have a fence or this school needs a fence more than this school. Think about it in terms of a consistent standard across the district. Okay? You'll answer these questions by yourself right now. It'll take you about eight minutes, but I'll check on you to see if you need any more time than that. And then we'll come back to large group and have some discussion and come to consensus around the same items. Anyone have any questions that I can help to clarify before we start? Alrighty, thank you. 